Well, it's my great pleasure to be here with all of you this morning, and thank you, Dr. Ross. You are very blessed to have such a wonderful place that has been set up for you to help you in your journey of health and wellness. And um, so this talk is, you know, uh, really designed to be quite an uh, all-day all day gathering with, for us to come together, to really touch on all the aspects and all the little paths we can go down to understand how to optimize our wellness, what, it, what, it, what that means, and what it entails um, from you know, some, some, some interesting vantage points. And so the first thing I'd like to say is that you know, Inner Health, Outer Radiance, uh, our Madiri Foundation is that what I believe in healing and wellness is first and foremost that it's a thing of togetherness. It's a we thing, not an I thing. In our world today, we're all like, we all have I don't actually, I don't have a smartphone, um, but most of us have iPhones, iPads, we have iServe, so this is really uh, move towards kind of self, everything's about self. People are all in, in their, their little, uh, their phones and their little world and they're missing the person right around them. So in the medical model that I've been working on and creating, it's a model of participation, it's a, ma a model of collaboration not just between the, the world around us and the world within us, but it's also about the medicine that, that I love, which is herbal medicine, botanical medicine, dietary medicine, food. It's all about a partnership. It's a very, very different way to think and that, that the way that we want to optimize our health really is, is in this partnership way. So this is uh, one of my books. So this is a book on wellness and how to live well. Um, it looks a little daunting, looks like a textbook, but it actually doesn't read terribly difficult. And so, uh, um, and these are a couple of other books. That's a book of mine on herbal medicine and cancer. These are two very recent books. This book is written, uh, has an has a interview with myself and several other practitioners, as well as several of my patients in there, and this is another recent book written on a woman with uh, advanced breast cancer that, um, that I helped immensely, and that's her story. And um, so just to let you know, this is what we're facing, you know, when we think in terms of individuals aging over the age of 65, what we're looking at, you know, 50% 50, 50 cardiovascular disease, 40% develop cancer. You know, we are living um, longer, but we're not living better. And so this is all about how to live better. And um, I think uh, people don't realize that in our country, America spends more than twice as much money on health care than any other country in the world, yet we usually rank in developed countries somewhere between 27 and 35 when you look every year where we fit in. So we're not one of the healthiest countries by any means, but yet we spend twice as much on healthcare than any other country. So leading causes of death in our country, well, you know, we can see heart disease, cancer, but what is the third leading cause? Medical error. And so what we don't want to get our, ourselves in a position is, is to be developing conditions, illnesses, and diseases and having to go on a plethora of medication um, because that, uh, you know, with, you know, with one medication, you have one thing being treated, but maybe a host of other things being uh, created by that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, our role is to try to do the best we can with as little medical intervention as possible. And that is about promoting health. That's, that's what we're doing, promoting health, not necessarily treating disease. So as you can see, the most stunning statistic is that total number of deaths caused by conventional medicine is astounding you know, almost close to a million per year, and that's reported. You know, and these are statistics, these are documented statistics, actually, and that doesn't include all the unreported, you know, this is just reported, you know, you gotta understand that. So, as you can see here, as I said, the top prescription for arthritis might cause heart attacks. The second prescription should prevent a heart attack, but it could damage your liver. You know, it goes on and on, and so you, again, you get into this place where you know, you're, you know, treating one thing and getting a couple of other things. And we, we want to try to the best of our ability, you know, keep you from that. And so the other thing is the importance of quality of life. You know, only one out of 10 people at the age of 80 or older is living in what we would call a good quality of life. 90% of people are living poor quality life. 
So how do we define health? So what does that mean for us? What does it, what does it mean to define health? So according to the World Health Organization, is a broader sense of a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, together sometimes referred to as the health triangle. And then I, de I define health well or wellness. Wellness can be defined rather abstractly as intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and physical vitality engaging in attitudes and behaviors that enhance the quality of life. It's a lot to it. So who has lived the longest on our planet? So here is the woman that has so far, a French woman. She's lived to 122 years. Yep. And so what factors can we attribute her great health to? You know, one is that she wakes up and starts her day with prayer. You know, long, long, quiet, still prayer. She stills her body when she gets up. She also drinks a glass of port wine every night after dinner, actually smokes a little cigar with that as well. <laughs> she drinks fresh squeezed orange juice, which is what I do usually first thing in the morning. That's how she starts her day. And um, likes uh, fruit and yogurt and, uh, and seems to live in, a, in an attitude of optimism as well. And that's her right there. Janine Clement, 120 years old, 120 years old, the most documented, longest living person that we know. So what, what I've developed is a system of medicine I call Madiri Medicine, Madiri Care. When we're optimizing wellness, we refer to it as Madiri Care. When we're getting more involved in people with chronic disease, it's Madiri Medicine. And then when we work with people in cancer, we call it Madiri Oncology. So it's a very um, what I call a unified system rather than integrative. I like to use the word unified because everything is designed to be united as one. One. One system. Not fragmented, not a bunch of different people doing different things, not understanding what they're doing. So this is all about united, and uniting and unified medicine. And it, <clears throat> it's personalized, it's adaptive, meaning that it can keep changing as you you know, as, as, as health and as life develops and unfolds. Um, and there's equal pl uh, focus placed on what I call the host, the microenvironment, and the tumor. And we'll get into that a little bit now. Here it is, optimizing wellness. And I, I do not like the word anti-aging. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with aging. That's a beautiful part of life, so we embrace that. So I like to call it aging gracefully or graceful aging. You know, that's really what we're doing. And, um, and then we have acute care. How do we manage acute care? We, how do we manage chronic disease? And then that focus on, on oncology. But as you'll see, the, th the thematic elements of whether you have a life-threatening disease or you're healthy, there's a foundational piece to this that is all constant, as you'll see. So when someone works in Madiri care, you know, you have a patient. Again, it's participatory. Partially what we're doing is providing education, providing information education. We're uh, sharing with other doctors as well. We, everything is encompassed in this sort of spiritual psychological support. You don't go down the road to see necessarily that person. You know, to me, medicine has to start with a place of purity and love. That's where it has to start, not with fear, not with worry. And so that has to be central, that central theme to, the, to, to medicine. We're assessing and monitoring and managing treatments, side effects, blood work, being an advocate, and personalizing not only botanical medicine, uh, nutritional medicine, but dietary and lifestyle medicine as well. And then this is how we look at each person. And I'm going quickly through just to give you a basis of, of the you know, the, the work that goes. So what we try to do is we don't use any one lens. You know, we, part of the lens is a very macro lens, looking, you know, looking globally, just looking out with our bare eyes at someone. Others are telescopes, some are microscopes. And the microscope gives you information that the broader lens doesn't give you. Give you. And all of it's valid and all of it's good and it all needs to be united to, and, and used um, in this kind of together we heal kind of concept. 
And so what we do first is work on the host. The host is us. It's, it's who we are, independent of disease or anything else. And so there's an assessment on the host, and our job is to actually make our health robust, resilient, to get our body to auto-regulate and get our body to auto-organize uh, better. So there's a boosting of what we call the life force. And from the life force comes a lot of other ways that we can support more specifically. But it's really to, to give a push or a lending hand to the innate capacity to heal, which, which I believe in. Every traditional model everywhere in the world has that same thematic um, understanding that we have the capacity to heal if we support ourselves correctly. The second part is the microenvironment, which is all the laboratory tests that, that you might have done and how you analyze those tests. Spending time with a person and learning about their symptom presentation, learning about who they are, gives different information than a laboratory report. One doesn't take the place of the other. And then lastly, we can get into genomics, we can get into looking at pathology when somebody has, uh, has cancer, and that lens of, you know, of looking molecularly at who we are gives us different information. And we don't want to get too caught up with this at the expense of this. We have to really see everything, how it, how it needs to be placed in that pie. Very, very important. So the first thing you need is this, this, this what I call purity of heart. You know, the, the heart has to be pure to see, you know, to see the path. It has to be. Then you have clear thinking, which is wisdom. And wisdom is different than knowledge. You can go on Google, you can go and search, and maybe get a lot of information. But it still doesn't give you insight or wisdom. So then you need the capacity to reason. You need the, the, the intellect, the perception of truth, and understanding in the harvest of good. And ultimately, as we age, we have to more and more contemplate on our purpose. You know, our purpose in life is to bring love and goodness to the world. There's nothing else that we're here for. And the more that we realize that, the, the, you know, the more joy that we can get out of life. So the, great, the greater the purity of heart, the better our, our awareness and capacity is to harvest truth, which gives us insight and guidance. <clears throat> so in that is what I call the thematic elements. And in here we can see, so here this thematic element is wisdom. Wisdom is ancient. The medical models that are thousands of years old are based in wisdom. What we extrapolate from clinical data, research, uh, evidence-based medicine is still not the same as what we get from these ancient medical models that have been practicing for thousands of years and have gotten, tr gotten to the place that this is true. Um, then we have the ability to combine science, you know, what I call the, the, the musical aspect of how classical music, like I use Stravinsky, for example, how classical music provides this framework in which you can work in. And I use Stravinsky specifically because of how you can take apart a piece of music and so much is going on in it from a rhythmic perspective, from a harmony perspective, from a melody perspective, and all of it by itself still doesn't make the music what it is. It's how all those pieces come together to make like, for example, the Rite of Spring, such an, an incredible piece of music. And then my big idol, who my son's named after, is John Coltrane. <coughs> and that's all about experimental, searching for truth, go breaking down the boundaries, never stopping and exploring, you know, and always basically reaching for God. I mean, that's what Coltrane's music was about, really trying to find the source, trying to find that the mystery of life. Um, and so when we do our assessment, like I said, you have the host, the energetics of the patient, the blood, sometimes urine test, and tissue-based testing. So I kind of went through that. So let's get into the host for a second, the human being. And so what makes up, how do we nourish ourselves? So there's three ways of nourishment. One is celestial. That's how we breathe. We have to breathe. We have to oxygenate our tissues and our bodies and our cells. Most people breathe shallowly. So a big part of what I try to do is teach people how to breathe. A lot of the great musicians, even Frank Sinatra, 
kept his voice good, even with all the abusive things he did, by swimming underwater. Tommy Dorsey was the first one to do that. So a lot of musicians actually get in pools and they hold their breath to swim underwater to bring and strengthen their lung capacity. But even just breathing, slowing down the respiration, learning to... Even if you do that before bed, you activate the vagus nerve and you won't believe how much easier it is to get to sleep just to focus on breath work. So, and a lot of medicine, a lot of herbs, and a lot of food oxygenate tissues of the body. Carotenoids, when you eat all those orange and red pigment foods. Saffron is probably the best oxygenator of any food you can eat. Chlorophyll, everything that's green oxygenates your body. When you eat chlorophyll, it is, um, <clears throat> first of all, chlorophyll and hemoglobin are identical short of one, one molecule. Iron and hemoglobin, magnesium and chlorophyll. So actually, the blood of us and the blood of the plant are one and the same short of one little thing. That's how close we are to being plants, if you want to think about it. One molecule. <laughs> so the second kind of nourishment is earthly nourishment, and that's the food and water, how we nourish our bodies through the food we eat. And the third is spiritual or heavenly nourishment, which is always about giving and receiving love and feeling a sense of purpose and belonging. This is essential. This is, might be more important than all the things you eat and everything else that you, you do for your health. It's probably the most essential thing. So what I say, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but the word health is derived from the root word how which also is the same root word for whole. So to be health means there has to be a, a holistic concept around health. And it's the same root word for holy. So in other words, to be healthy means to be whole, which also means to be holy. <coughs> this just happened to me this week. This is Oris Bedridge, to me, one of the most incredible living human beings on our planet right now. He's written over 32 books. He is the world authority in quantum physics. Um, brilliant, brilliant mind, but his book, which I put here, he has 32 books he's written and published. But his book, and I have a whole library on theology, you know, like, like you can't believe, but his book, Celebrate Your Divinity, is my favorite book I've ever written on theology. It is so profound and so beautiful. And he's just, if you're in his presence, he's just, he's just angelic-like. He just glows, you know, his energy does. And so I had just a couple of days ago in New York City the opportunity to spend about three hours. We, we prayed together. We, he's Ukrainian, and I lived in a Ukrainian monastery, a Byzantine Franciscan monastery for three years. We were singing all the liturgical songs, you know, together, and him and his wife in, in Slovak, which I don't really remember, um, but it was, it was just beautiful. It's, we were transported to another another realm for a couple of hours. And you can look up his name, amazing person. So let's get a little bit more into looking at chronic disease now for a second and the ways of you know, what's happening. You know, how, do, how do we look at our health as we're aging? So what are the, some of the compounding factors and how do we go about that? So big one, this is chronic disease. So we have the impact of stress hormone. We have inflammation as a, as a these are, these are these are kind of um, involved in almost every disease as we're getting older and also causing shortening lifespan and also diminished quality of life. So we have to look at how do we support the nervous system. I call that primary. My book, which was written just a few years ago, I, if I was to say there was one thing I would do differently if I wrote it today, it would be more emphasis on the nervous system even. That would be what I would do. So we have that aspect, nourish the life force, which is with botanical adaptogens, um, uh, modulate or buffer inflammation, because all chronic disease has got an inflammatory component to it. You have, you have the control of insulin and glucose, very, very important. And we're really maximizing efficiency. That's one of the most important things to do. It's not replacing. you know. Almost any drug you t take is a drug that replaces something we want our own bodies to do. With, with, with this approach, and that's not always, you know, the, that's the last resort, but it's something that we have to keep in our toolbox as well. But is it possible to increase efficiency, 
better glucose utilization, better insulin utilization. Then we look at a byproduct of a lot of this is an increase in oxidative stress. So, so, and then we have also movement. So we always, as we're getting older, and most disease has what we call stagnation component to it. And that stagnation is oxygen. So we talked about breathing, how we oxygenate the body. We have the lymph system and we have the blood. So we're trying to move these things in a healthy way. And then our toolboxes, and our toolboxes are this. Botanical, which I mostly call the humble toolbox. You know, it, ha it presents itself in, and when you're talking in terms of botanical medicine, not necessarily an herb can be manipulated to be very heroic or very glamorous. You know, we know that. But, the, but botanical medicine as a whole is gentle. And sometimes things happen very slowly without notice, but those are the most therapeutic changes. Therapeutic change sometimes happens slow. And then you have more glamorous medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, you have dietary medicine, how we use what we eat to improve our health. We have nutritional medicine, is, which is how we use supplementation, su how we supplement our diet with nutrients. Then we have lifestyle medicine. And these are all what I call spokes on a wheel, macro and micro medicine working together. And this, the psycho-spiritual influence of the practitioner is part of the treatment effect. <clears throat> And this is, again, a little example of things working, working together, you know, breaking it down. So I'm going to go through some of these. And then when you put a protocol together, what we call a protocol, these are, this is what it might look like. Pretty much everybody gets a medicinal smoothie, sometimes a medicinal soup. Um, certain exercise programs are, are recommended, these treatments, some diet with recipes, um, list of supplementation, botanical nutritional dosaging and timing and a lot of personalized medicine, personalized herbal formulas, maybe teas, topical suppositories, inhalation therapy, various tests to, to be run. So that's just what a protocol might look like. And the basis of what we do, so a starting point, whether it's health optimization or even working with somebody with a very advanced disease, what I have found, one of the best ways to start your day, to kick your day off, to really bathe your body with a lot of healthy stuff in the easiest way in the lifestyle that we live today is what I call a medicinal smoothie, where you can put all of these great things together in one drink, blend it up, you know, you macerate it so it's, it's not, you know, if you're on the go, it's not as hard for your body to, to break things down. And um, we start with a basic recipe and uh, all of these wonderful things uh, go in it. So we have even botanicals, various foods with, with high density nutrition, and sometimes um, nutritional agents as well. One of the things we do is what I call the all-one smoothie pack mix, which is a all-organic food-based multivitamin, multimineral with various super greens in it. The most, my favorite super green, which is the richest one in there, is a humble weed called nettles, which I consider the most nutrient-dense plant on the face of the planet. So that goes in there with barley grass, um, uh, chlorella and about nine, nine different um, uh, vegetables and also 12 certified freeze-dried berries as well. So that all goes in one thing, the multivitamin, the super greens, the super fruit. No need for a vitamin, no need to get your multivitamin, no need to get a green product, no need to get a fruit. It's all in one, so it's the easiest thing. And then what we base our, our nutrients predominantly on is what I call naturized nutrients. And so naturized nutrients are very different. They're not isolates. When you go and buy a supplement, whether it's natural or synthetic, it's still an isolate. And that's not, not to say, you know, I use Ben Franklin, I quote him a lot, to say a place for everything, everything is in its place. I'm not saying that that's all horrific, but it's not the starting point. It's not close to nature. So how do we get supplements and nutrients that are the closest thing to, to food? Well, one way is this naturized process, which is basically they take, we take the oldest organism called Saccharomyces ruvisi, or depending on the nutrient, a bio yogurt culture to grow the nutrient in. So the nutrient is given to the culture, the culture grows, grows, grows. As it grows, the nutrient becomes more dense in that culture and then when it reaches a certain percentage, 
that becomes the supplement. So not only are you getting this, this, this grow or this naturized nutrient, but you're getting all these intrinsic uh, uh, nutrients that go with it, that maximize the absorption, that have our bodies receive it more like food, and provide nutrition independently of that nutrient. So for me, it's the most beautiful way to supplement. And then we also do a powdered blend with sort of a lot of um, immuno, what's called immunonutrition or anabolic nutrition and nutrients where we use a non-denatured whey protein, certain amino acids uh, like um, magnesium chelated to creatine, magnesium chelated to glutamine, colostrum. So this provides the, the, a lot of um, anabolic and immunonutrition along with those other nutrients. And so these are the basis. And then in the smoothie, and I'm sure we use some coconut powder sometimes, some additional fruits, a, a mixed fruit, anthracyanin drink, sometimes some flax seeds, which give you a great source of lignans, um, choline, inositol, uh, uh, various um, uh, what's called a, uh, a source of omega-3s, ALA, alpha, linoleic acid, um, and then you get in the smoothie, we usually use a kefir or a yogurt. I prefer goat uh, with that. So you're going to get some great probiotic and, again, further nutrients. I put mangoes and raspberries in, and then we'll put our, our adaptogen drink. You can put that in, have it separate. So to me, this is sort of a great basis to really fortify our nutrition and start our day off. So now let's move into what I call ETMS, which is the way... The more technical term for Madiri medicine is the, the methodology of, the, of Madiri medicine is called ETMS, which stands for the Eclectic Triphasic Medical System. So what, you know, what I call ETMS 101, which is the first objective, the first and the starting point, is, the, is to build the life force, build the vitality of the person. So the most therapeutic change is one that accesses and supports the individual's innate capacity to heal, promote robustness, resiliency, auto-regulate, auto-organize. Their motto, the eclectic model, the eclectics were the great physicians in our country anywhere from 100 to 300 years ago. They were all over America, and they were the natural healers. And that was their motto, sustain the life force. John Erie Lloyd, Finley Ellingwood, Eli Jones, Joseph Buchanan. Uh, these were great, great physicians that we had that, that their toolbox was botanical medicine. And then we see from Star Wars, the life force, or the force is what gives a Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. And it's true. So how do, we, how do we now break that life force down? So we have three main energy pathways within the life force. One is that, that heavenly energy, which is eternal energy. As we live and grow, all of, we're, oh, we are getting older. So essence and force is, is going to diminish. We can mitigate it to a degree, but we can't stop it. But we can keep promoting our, our vital spirit. That's our opportunity. So we can keep getting our spiritual energy richer and <clears throat> in every way. And meeting somebody like Oris Bedridge, who's 90, his spirit is just so full and so growing. And still, he says, I still have a book to write, you know, he's saying to me, another one. And uh, so our vital essence is a way that we look and nourish our endocrine or hormonal self. Every hormone goes into the reservoir of the vital essence, and then our vital force is how we extrapolate energy from the food we eat and the air we breathe. It has a lot to do with our lung capacity, our digestive capacity, how the engine of our cell, our mitochondria, pulls glucose, lipids, makes energy, and um, so that's a breakdown of what I call the life force. And our, what I call the soul of our medicine, for me, the soul is, is plants. Plants are the soul. And I, and I put them together like a little jazz ensemble. And if you're a plant, you can work medicinally in the body just like a musician works. You can change. You can play it slower. You can change the rhythm. You can change the beat. You can alter your, your, your sense of the melody. You know, that's, you know a, a drug is very one-dimensional. It's robotic. It's like if we were machines or ro robots, 
we would be very, uh, drugs would be perfect for us. We had no need for herbs at all, but we're not. You know, everything in our body is in flux. Everything is changing like this. So we need, the basis of this medicine is an ability to understand that because plants are living entities just like us. They've been here a lot longer than we have. You know that? They've been here way longer. And if you were a plant, you couldn't, a plant can't get up and run away from an invader. A plant can't get up and go harvest food. So to be a plant is pretty stationary for the most, most part. And so as a plant has had to develop very sophisticated, what we call secondary metabolites, to be able to not only survive but thrive in extremely harsh environments. What's beautiful is those secondary metabolites, not the primary ones, that have been developed in the plants that when we ingest them, they do the most good for our body. It's pretty amazing. This is just how, again, how botanicals work differently than pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals are more functional, more blocking or replacing. They're able to turn off. They're more singular, sometimes dual, and they come with quite a bit of often side effects and toxicity. Plants, more gentle, enhance response, very, very different, enhance efficiency, can sometimes buffer or turn something down but not really block things, and they're very great at multitasking. They target multiple pathways. You can see molecularly them working, cellularly working, at the organ tissue level network, and often, I mean, anything can be manipulated to be toxic. You know, uh, Pericles says that, you know, it's all about the dose. And it, that's really, really true. So I'm not saying that you can't misuse plant medicines and cause problems. But in that concept, that holistic concept of botanical medicine and nourishment and life force at the primary focus, you know, your and And so here is a great description of putting herbs together, like in the way that I do things. Again, I like to use music as a great way. Again, John Coltrane, that's uh, Out of This World, one of his later albums. <coughs> But you can see we combine herbs that I think are more glamorous and more heroic, but I like to use low dosages of those. So even when I have to use what I call an herb that's more of an effector, stronger, because we have to turn the corner a little bit with somebody's help, even then I use the lowest dose I can because I'm combining it with what I call more adaptogens, more nourishing plants, more tonic herbs, and then we harmonize this with those and are gentle and humble medicines. So slow, sl a slow push or a nourishing, in, uh, activate innate self-healing, and sometimes use more non-specific medicine with specific medicine. And here's a good example of how of herbs that we might use. Um, Shataveria is my favorite, what I call inward nourishing plant for that essence. You know, in, uh, uh, in Ayurvedic, it's one of the Rasianas. It's considered the most important herb for female health. And when I mean female, I don't mean necessarily just women, but that, that female energy. Um, we have more of a yang tonic, possibly, which is more anabolic. So the yang represents masculine strength. The yin represents feminine, which is elasticity, flexibility. Um, the primary uh, adaptogens, so we have <laughs> Shazandra as an example of that. We have a secondary adaptogen, a profound one called astragalus, and then we combine what I call those nervines or vital spirit plants. One example is an herb called albizia, which is the mimosa tree. I think, do those grow up this far north? Yeah. yeah. So the mimosa is one of the most uh, uh, highest acclaimed medicines in China, in, China in, in traditional Chinese medicine. It is uh, that pink flower. It's, it nourishes the spirit. They use it to help people that have a lot of stress. And we know now it's, it's got an ability to, 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 be, to calm anxiety. It's an immune modulator. It buffers a lot of uh, hyperimmune function, regulates glucose and insulin, and it even has an ability to uh, um, modestly raise serotonin levels. And so then we have Scutellaria latiflora. That's our native skullcap plant. It's a great, great plant, calms, tonifies, regenerates the nervous system. It's a muscle relaxant. So just how you can combine different, different types of herbs uh, and have them work together. And then the nervous system, like I said, and the endocrine system, the pituitary, the hypothalamus linking these together. And, um, 
and that's my favorite nervine, hypericum, and that's the, the uh, silicum sanctum, which is the holy basil. It's called Tulsi in Ayurvedic medicine. Everybody in India, anyone practicing the Hindu faith, has a Tulsi plant in their home. It's a revered medicine. And so energy, again, is a two-way street. As we're putting energy out, guess what's not happening? There's no energy going in. And so if your output of energy is greater than your input, eventually your body's going to break down. And as you get older, that energy, like I said, as a whole, it's like a candle. It's, it's more dim, so it's more precious. So you have to be more and more, un you have to understand this more and more. And what we'll do with our medicine is expand that, you know, bring the candle up a little bit, but still you have to be aware and sometimes make changes to basically have restoration be equal, if not greater than expenditure of energy. And then we build a strong foundation. And what most importantly we want to do is not waste energy. That's worry, added stress, learning to, to, to you can get a lot done you know, the great basketball coach, another my favorite sport is basketball, John Wooden, says it's, it's never, it's uh, be, a, be quick, you can be quick, but never be in a hurry. So quick and efficient is great, but when you're feeling anxious and you're in a hurry, you got to stop. You know, so, uh, and so here the two, to balance really good essence, we need to keep our strength up, and if you notice we have as people are getting older, we're even if you don't have a condition or disease, you're getting more frail, you're weakening. So a big part of our medicine is to how to strengthen, make us stronger. But strength without building that inward energy, inward energy might be even more important, which provides the moisture, the lubrication, the elasticity, the flexibility. You know, even if you have a really strong heart, if it's too rigid and you have stress, it locks up and you have a heart attack and you die. So the heart has to be supple, but it also has to be strong. So that balance, you know, everything in health has this beautiful balance, you know, that, that finding that nice way to nourish both things. That's why extreme exercise that's just all about muscle building and strength makes us too rigid. We lose our flexibility, but we need a little bit of both. And some people might need more than others, but it's, it's really important to balance these two things. And what we're learning is that the overall health, like in a disease like cancer, people focus on the cancer, killing the cancer. But what we're learning and what data is saying is that the more robust the health of the patient, the better they do, the longer they live. So here you can see in breast cancer, the overall health was key to beating breast cancer. Women with poor physical health scores had a 27% increased risk of experiencing either a reoccurrence of their breast cancer or a new cancer and a 65% increased risk of death from any cause. So underneath it, it's not to say, don't get too fixated on the disease. You can get, you've got to focus a little bit on that, but at the same time, you've got to focus on all these other things. And here is catabolic anabolic. So the catabolic is our body breaking down, anabolic is our body restoring, building up. Everything that we put in our mouth does both these things. So we have to take our food, and catabolic just means making energy. So how do we take the food and have our output of energy? It's all about efficiency. Making our cells utilize energy efficiently, and then how do we take the food we eat and build healthy cells? That's the anabolic function. How do we restore and build our health up? And so here, accelerated catabolic aging caused by excess cortisol, <coughs> inward and outward essence deficiency, as I said. So right here, the overall catabolic effect of excess cortisol brings about marked muscle wasting. You can see especially in quadriceps, femur, femur groups with early inability to mount stairs, the skin thins out almost uh, paper-like, disappearance of elastic fibers. So this means that the more output of glucocorticoids we have, whether we're taking steroids or just innately overproducing them, our body starts wasting too quickly. So again, with, with herbal medicine, we can increase anabolic health, we can make a more efficient usage of energy pathways, but the other thing we do is we expand what's called the, the hormatic 
uh, uh, dynamic range of healthy stability. So we actually can widen this so we can actually do more without our bodies breaking down. That's the beauty of the medicine, to expand the hormatic uh, range of healthy stability. And we'll see that in a, mile, in a little while. Low muscle mass ties to death risk in early stage breast cancer. Women that had sarcopenia did poorly and much more. And so these are things that people don't want to address because they're, they're, you know, it takes more, it takes participation. You know, it's easy just to take your, you know, your drug and go away, but this has a great impact. Sarcopenia was associated with a 41% greater relative risk for death compared with patients without sarcopenia. So we can, you know, this is, and, I, and this is just a couple of tasty slides. I have so many, I could go all day on any of these subjects with data for you. I just picked a, I have a whole bunch of hidden slides here that I can't get to. Um, just showing you just a little taste of it. It's well recognized that a decrease in skeletal muscle mass, density, strength, and or function is associated to increased treatment toxicity and post-operative complications as well as poor progression-free survival and overall survival. This is a 2018 study. You know, muscle protein anabolism in cancer patients respond to anabolic adaptogens botanicals, protein, and amino acids, and fatty acids. So that's all part of it, what's called immunonutrition. And the immunonutrition without the botanicals only goes so far. The botanicals without the immunonutrition only goes so far. So part of the beauty is what I call the dynamic duo. When the nutrition and the botanicals are working side by side, that's what's amazing. And what we use is this is a, a whey protein concentrate alone as part of a multi-ingredient formula, increased strength, fat-free mass, and lean body mass in resistant trained individuals. Improved body composition as well in 262 sarcopenic tube-fed patients. <clears throat> so how do we assess anabolic biological aging? This is when you go in for testing and say, what do all these tests mean? These are some of the tests that we run to look at. Anabolic, catabolic measurement, uh, DHEA, testosterone, vitamin D, body mass index, um, uh, fasting insulin, C-peptide, hemoglobin A1C. Not going to get too technical with this. Uh, but you can see here, DHEA is kind of the, the hormone in the adrenal medulla. The, the glucocorticoids are in the adrenal cortex, and again, it's the yin-yang aspect of just the adrenal gland. So as we're burning out more external energy, sometimes that inward DHEA energy is going down. So this is, uh, you know, improving, normalizing DHEA sulfate can have significant benefits both in libido and older women, improved skin status, um, hydration, um, epidermal thickness. So this is just a little bit on that. And what I like to do is mostly try to do it as m best I can with botanical medicine nourishing the essence. And then testosterone is another anabolic hormone, but we don't want to replace it. You know, men get older, they have lower testosterone, and so low testosterone is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and mortality, yet Testosterone replacement use is associated with significant increased adverse cardiovascular events and increased mortality. Well, those two things might not make sense, but they totally do. You know, to, because what we want to do is nourish the essence and gently bring these things up and allow our body to be the one regulating these things, not take and say, here's your replacement therapy. So low testosterone can cause depression in older men, Hypothyroidism symptoms may include fatigue, trouble concentrating and sleeping, as well as feeling depressed. So this is our essence depleting. And here's androgen deficiency. So when your testosterone's low, your cholesterol's up. You know, so what they do is they, you take a cholesterol-lowering medicine, which then also lowers your testosterone. Then you take your testosterone replacement. Again, you get, you know, it's, it's like, because uh, the building block to every hormone is cholesterol. So partially, we get older, our cholesterol goes up and our hormones go down. So the idea is to efficiently transfer cholesterol into healthy hormones, to make that transition, to help our bodies do what it really naturally wants to do. But all these things are byproducts of low testosterone. So here's how we work. Again, we don't replace, just have a sip of water.
one of my favorite slides, a recent slide I created. So medicine should lend a helping hand. That's my general hypothesis, not take over. True progress quietly and persistently moves along without notice. St. Francis of Assisi. I believe that most, most is so, so true. Botanicals, humble. And this system, so this is that healthy range of dynamic stability. And when these things start getting out of that range, that's when disease occurs. And so we're not trying to have this be here because we're not like that. Everything's in flux. So there is a range. So, some, so the, the way that I think in terms is try to bring this closer into this range and then with our toolbox, our medicine, actually expand this range so there's greater capacity. Make ourselves healthier so we can handle more. So a healthy system operates, behaves within a range of dynamic stability. This behavior is driven in part by powerful intrinsic properties including self-organization and robustness. Therefore, it may be sufficient to provide a gentle push at the right time to bring a dysregulated system back into this range of dynamic stability. So here is the more stronger pharmaceutical hammering it down, forcing it down. And here, whoops, what happened there? And here is our gentle herbal medicine, just giving a gentle push. And again, that doesn't mean we don't need hammers. Sometimes we do. You know, sometimes we need to, to, to use that strong medicine. But the more we can do this, and the outcome, the long-term beneficial outcome is going to be much greater. That's one of my favorite slides. Did everyone get that? <laughs> Wasn't that cool? So here, when we look at essence, so rather than see everything as disconnected, so, oh my gosh, I have this problem. Oh my gosh, I have that problem. Let me give this for that. Let me give that. And the way that I think is that let us first nourish the reservoir, that reservoir of essence, and see how these things can come back into harmony. Or let us nourish this along with giving a little bit of help to any one of these things that need it together. And then even if you need pharmaceuticals to do something, the dosage is going to be minuscule compared to if you didn't do this. So you'll need a very low dose rather than what initially might have been needed was a high dose. So some examples of herbs that we use. So for inward essence, Shataveria, which is the root the, of the wild asparagus, by the way, Romania, Eucomia, Fenugreek, Vitex, Royal Jelly. These are just examples of herbs for that inward essence. And then for the outward essence, we have herbs like Epimedium, which is actually nicknamed horny goat weed, believe it or not, uh, Repuncticum carthamoides, which is the common name is marrow root because the elk, it's the favorite food of the elk, and the elk are known for their robustness and strength, and they dig that up like there's no tomorrow and eat that to strengthen themselves. It's the richest source of natural um, plant hormones called ectosterones, there's over 100 ectosterones in Rapuncticum. Macuna pruens, which is the richest source of uh, L-dopa, which then produces dopamine, which then helps to produce testosterone. It's also one of the best plants, if not the best plant, showing benefit in Parkinson's disease. And uh, tribulus, cordyceps, uricoma longiflora, Jack. So these boost that kidney yang energy. And these are just examples of outward essence plants. Uh, Arjuga, Turkestina, another one of the really ectosterone rich plants. This is a study that found that Arjuga extract increased protein synthesis by 25 or 31 percent. So, um, and that's rich in those ectosterones. These are tribulus, has protodianosin, uh, um, epimedium has icarin. And so you can see the macuna has the L-dopa. And another one that's incredible for bone health is Cissus quadrangularis, uh, which is rich in what's called ketosterones as well. So I don't want to get too much. And then the inward plants, these are examples here of the compounds, the active compounds, which are relative to the actions, to some of these actions of the plants. And then I like, just gave some examples, like as, as we get over, uh, older, you know, more than 50% of men suffer su from some prostate ailment, whether it be getting prostate cancer, benign prostate disease, prostatitis, 
So some of the herbs that we, we are so amazing for that, Saranoa reptans, which is rich in fatty acids and sterols, Urtica root, the root of the, uh, um, I talked about the nettles plant, the root of the plant is amazing for the health of the prostate. Pygium africanum bark, which is rich in sterols. Crativa, which is rich in lupinol. And then um, actually pumpkin seeds are really good for the prostate. And pumpkin seed oil. Pumpkin seed oil has been shown to inhibit 5-alpha reductase and aromatase as well. Two things that happen with aging that we want to try to mitigate if we can. And then our primary starting point, so the foundation, so you have your essence herbs. Now, under, uh, now with that are always what we call the nonspecific primary, secondary, and companion adaptogens. And so what is an adaptogen? It's an herb. This is a, a Nicholas, Dr. Nikolai uh, Lazarus. Any substance that exerts effects on both sick and healthy individuals by correcting any dysfunctions without producing unwanted side effects. So they're the most researched plants um, in the world, and they build robustness, resiliency, auto-regulate, auto-organize, better efficiency, energy, adaptation, protection. They normalize, are non-specific, non-toxic, even with prolonged usage. Those are the definitions of what an adaptogen is. So they enhance energy, adaptation, production, and increase lifespan. So adaptogenic formulas are the foundation of botanical medicine. Their unique mode of beneficial action includes the expansion of homodynamic space. Remember I said, you're getting more out of our body without it causing illness on us. And here's just some research uh, showing adaptogens increasing lifespan and stress resistance in worms. So you can see here the, both extracts, the extracts here, rhodiola rosea and Eleutherococcus senecosis, two of the most widely used adaptogens were shown to increase the lifespan and then at least four independent experiments at different dosages significantly increased lifespan between 10 and 20 percent. And then here is an adaptogenic formula of 10 herbs often used for fatigue and energy. So it's a, that's how I do things, lots of, lots of herbs combined together, not any one herb. So this, all the life-spanning, extending adaptogenic herbs, also attenuated levels of H2O2, enhanced heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are cellular protective mechanisms against stress, various stress. It's interesting, in plants, what a plant does in our healthy cells, it does the opposite in our cancer cells. So heat shock proteins are part of the way cancer cells develop resiliency themselves and also develop resistance to drug therapies. The same plants that build heat shock proteins in healthy cells inhibit them in cancer cells. Um, the same is true for uh, tel telomere as well. They strengthen the telomere in healthy cells. They inhibit telomere uh, length in uh, cancer cells, and telomere is strengthening as well. Panax ginseng, one of the king adaptogens, significantly extended lifespan, again, of worms in a, in a study that was conducted. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I got to get through this section because I, uh, uh, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, three minutes I have, love. I have a clock right here. Well, thank you. <laughs> ashwagandha extract reduces stress and anxiety in adults. Ashwagandha is another classic adaptogen. So not only is it building robustness, but here it is, a human study showing how it reduces stress and uh, reduces anxiety. One of our, and that herb is called Withenia somnivera. So the word ashwagandha in Sanskrit means strong as a horse. The word Withenia somnivera in Latin means restful sleep. That's the beauty of an adaptogen. How can a plant be called restful sleep and strong as a horse at the same time? But it does, you know? And as we can see here, diagnosis of major depression on the rise, especially in teens and millenniums. In the last three years, depression and anxiety in teens has gone up 25% just in the last three years. We have some major factors. And so we're just going to do the life spirit, and then we're going to get into a little bit more on aging, on nutrition, and on diet for the second half of the talk. 
But for me, the nervous system, nourishing the vital spirit is primary. So you can see the essence and the heart network and then also the liver as well. These are things. At the heart, there's a physiological connection and rhythm between our divinity and our physical existence. Look at how many diseases connect to the nervous system. Might be the most important aspect of health, including chronic uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality. All these research in that one area. And so a big part is nourishing the vagus nerve. Balances the nervous system called rest and digest. Why do we have so many digestive problems? Why are 32 million Americans taking proton pump inhibitors? Because you can't digest well if you're not in parasympathetic mode. The two don't go hand in hand. It, and why are so many herbs that help digestion nerve vines? Chamomile, isn't it? My, my Italian grandmother would give us chamomile tea every night after dinner. It relaxes and it improves digestion. You know, so it's beauty how nature does these things for us. So development of our compassion, telepathy, empathy towards others, intuition, the gut knowing, all of these things enhances our evolution as a species. So evolution, it shows the vagus nerve is, is, is what may be the most important thing to, 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 uh, to reversing chronic disease, particularly cancer and heart disease. And here it is connected to the immune system and the gut to the neurological system, to the neuroendocrine system, and to the cardiovascular system. Central to immune surveillance, longevity, and regeneration. And so here is the heart rate variability as a way of measuring um, the vagus nerve, which I believe they, the Crossroads provides for you. And you can see that it's a predictor of all-cause mortality. And then even heart rate itself, so just how many beats here you have a minute, uh, is also 45 non-randomized prospective cohort studies were recently in a meta-analysis found that rusting heart rate was an independent predictor of coronary artery disease, stroke, sudden death, and non-cardiovascular disease over all other studies combined. In animals, there is an inverse negative correlation between heart rate and lifespan, meaning the faster your heart rate is, the shorter your lifespan is. So when you look at animals and you study animals. And this is, uh, let's go through the vagus nerve, and this is treating vagal nerve-related gastric and digestive conditions. So when someone comes with, say, um, GERD or heartburn and things like that, it's not enough just to treat that as a specific entity. So we'll use digestive aids, demulsants, carminatives, bitters, and relaxants. Then we'll combine it with the nerve vines, and then we'll get the body to auto-regulate with adaptogens. So we're hitting it from non-specific ways nervous system and then direct ways. And that's, that's you know, what I call the beaut beautiful medicine. And then my favorite nerve vines, these are some of them. And these are the pictures of the beautiful plants. Um, but St. John's wort is, to me, the most amazing plant. Um, and you can see here, clinical studies, 27 clinical trials with a total of um, almost 4,000 patients reviewed compared St. John's wort to SSRIs antidepressants, basically. In patients with mild to moderate depression, St. John's wort extract demonstrated comparable response and significant lower discontinuation dropout rate compared to standard SSRIs. That's a 2017 March uh, pooled study of 27 clinical trials. And th this is the complexity of all the compounds in that beautiful plant and all the different parts within the brain that are affected by the, the, the various compounds. And then here is another new study on, on the efficiency of hyperdicum compared to an SSRI in patients with moderate ma major depression episodes. Beneficial effects of St. John's wort have been also shown in patients with moderate to severe depression. In this study, reduction of the HAMD total score was significantly more pronounced in patients with moderate depression treated with St. John's wort compared to the SSRI. I mean, people aren't aware of this you know, incredible research. And then lastly, and then we're going to take our break, this is on another, not so much a nerve vine, but the number one heart herb, nourishing heart herb. I want to show you the number one tonic nourish hot heart herb is Cretaceous, the hawthorn leaf and flower more so than the berry. This is a recent study done at NYU showing 
what a dramatic difference it is giving patients all on all kinds of pharmaceuticals, adding just, just um, Hawthorne extract and the, the favor outcome with cancer, uh, cardiac mortality here, sudden cardiac death, everything favored those taking uh, Hawthorne. And this was done you know, at, um, in New York City, uh, very, very large study, just recently published as well, two-year mortality study with 1,300 patients exposed. With, in a high-risk category. So as Jenny said, um, study finds inner kindness is the key to happiness. Look at that. Where we want to be, calm, serene, and content. That's where we want to be. Amen. And then here, studies, a meta-analysis across 148 studies found the influence of social relationship on the risk of mortality comparable to others. So having a, a good, good social interaction was as equal to changing your diet and anything else. So you could actually smoke, you could smoke, you could be obese. If you had a healthy life other than that, you were equally as good if those other things weren't there. So note, we'll take a break. Now Here is, I'm going to start with this also wonderful meta-analysis study showing that social isolation was a major risk factor for mortality. So this includes all of us that even have aging grandparents or with people. It's really important in every culture until modern times, as people got older, they were more revered and cared for and their wisdom was, was sought out by the younger generation. We now have a world where the younger generation is, thinks they you know, know it all and, uh, and again, I'll quote um, uh, the great basketball coach um, who said that you don't learn anything until after you know it all. <laughs> and so it's important for us to reach out. And then music. I'm a musician. I'm a jazz musician. So you can see here, you know, calming music has beneficial effects on humans, animals, and even plants, resulting in diminished agitation improved mood, and lower levels of stress. And so here you can see the flute player calming the cobra. So how beautiful it is. And then here you can see me just recently this summer playing a show. Um, my stage name is Funk Monk because I lived in a monastery. So when I play, <laughs> I play funky bass. I'm a funky bass player. <laughs> so here's a Concran review study analyzed evidence of 30 trials showing that suggested that that music intervention was useful as a complementary treatment to, to help uh, people with cancer. It also led to a reduction in heart rate as well as heart rate variability. So music and, and I kind of use the lens of music how I see everything. Everything has a rhythm, everything has a beat, um, everything has a melody, everything has a harmony. And so it's a great way to uh, and then the next thing is laughter and cold water. So if you want to activate your vagus nerve, you know, uh, laughter is really, really great medicine. And so, and there's two types of laughter. There's laughing at funny jokes, which is great, but the other laughter is to be able to kind of poke fun at yourself or, you know, spill something on your shirt and not get bent out of shape and just kind of make light. That kind of laughter is even more therapeutic, you know, to ba basically have a good sense of humor around life. And then the next thing is sleep. So sleep is imperative to good health. I don't care what you take, whatever you do. So it, you know, uh, meeting sleep guidelines, seven to nine hours, is associated with better and longer life. You know, obtaining optimal levels of sleep is associated with better health-related quality of life scores and reduced premature mortality risk by 19%. So you see how all these little things fit together you know, how they do. And this is physical activity and all the benefits basically of physical activity from, you know, cardiovascular, muscle skeletal, oncological, both pre prevention of can cancer, but also people with cancer, um, endocrine health. And you'll see, I'm going to go into hormesis and talk about how, how everything needs to be in balance because too much exercise is as bad as, as no exercise. And then this was a study just showing uh, breast cancer, regular moderate exercise was associated with lower risk of invasive breast cancer. And then those who engaged in at least four hours of walking 
uh, per week for four years had a 10% lower risk of disease compared to those who ex exercise less frequently in the same time period. So just a couple. I probably have like 50 slides on, on, on these things. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. So this is the next section here. This is just a little bit more technical, but this is one of the ways. This is called the quality control theory of aging. So in here we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is really protein misfolding, like, like how our cells are utilizing amino acids and how we're generating mitochondrial energy, not just how we're getting the energy, but how much exhaust we're having. Think of your body like a car, like and there's and the car as we get older is running down the road less efficient, puttering, not good when you put the gas to the, the pedal to the metal, and also, all of a sudden, all this exhaust is coming out at the same time. So the objective isn't to put a new muffler on the car, it's to, it's to tune that engine up. So this is about engine tuning. This is also, to a degree, about en engine tuning. So AMPK is everything to do with, with the utilization of sugar and insulin. So most what we call plants, most of the plants, even adaptogens, but a, one way of understanding herbs that improve this is through activation of AMPK, which have what's called an insulin trophic effect. So the idea is to maximize and make better usage of insulin and glucose, both targeting glucose to the receptors, the cell receptors, binding to those receptors, those insulin binding receptors, and then making more efficient usage of what's called the glucose transporters, which transport the sugar from the cell receptor to the mitochondria. When that's all happening efficiently and we're eating whole foods, we're doing everything else right, your body works optimally. And then the big one is the beta adrenergic receptor, which goes to the vagus nerve, how we regulate stress in our life. And then here, this is all about looking at epigenetics. That's the telomere, that's the, the histone, histone, what's called histone uh, deacetylase, and that we accomplish with what's called through the diet, through what's called isothiocinates, which is a lot of those cruciferous brassicus vegetables that we, we know are important for eating, and then through short-chain fatty acids and butyrate, and I have, in a little while, I'm gonna get a little bit into that with food. And so here's different testing that you can do. These are things when you come you know, to a clinic like this, you'll look at all these testing, like homocysteine, fibrinogen, you'll look at ox oxidative biomarkers like MDA, um, glutathione status you can look at, um, cellular aging status, you can measure uh, telomere length, you can look at those heat shock proteins, you can look at inflammation, very important, endocrine biomarkers, and then nutrient biomarkers too. And I have a whole little section we're going to get into in a second, all on the, the, the uh, plethora of uh, uh, nutrient deficiencies that we all have and how important it is to address those for good health. And epigenetics, so we don't have control over the genes that we have, we're born with those genes, but we have control over how they're expressed. And not only can we, we minimize the activation of some of those maybe abnormal genes, but we can also maybe even reprogram. So this idea of, of reprogramming and restilling good, you know, good genomic health is actually possible, again, through plant medicine and through dietary medicine and maybe even how we begin to think in our attitude as well. So old human cells, you know, the number one compounds that are most researched to benefiting health and extending lifespan is called stillbins. And stillbins, remember I talked about how the stress of the plant activates these secondary metabolites? One of the main metabolites are called the stillbin compounds, and they're immune cytokines within the plant. And the more stressed the plant is, the higher the stillbins get. So a good example is wine and grapes. So that compound resveratrol in the grape is that the more the grape is stressed, like we live in grape country, we live in like a, you know, what's called the new Napa Valley, southern Oregon. And it has um, very, the, the, the soil is not very rich where they grow all the grapes, these great, great vineyards. And they get very little rain. We get no rain all summer long. And it looks like the grape is so, you know, is so stressed, the vine is so stressed, but the more it, it, it makes that resveratrol, 
the healthier the grape is to consume, but also that it adds to the taste and the flavor and a lot of those little subtleties that people all, you know, all the wape, uh, uh, wine connoisseurs come to understand. So resveratrol is the most researched compound with regards to enhancement of CERT1. And so we use a lot of resveratrol in our, you know, one of our foundation formulas called Botanical Treasures, but also in a formula called CV Rescue as well, which has another stillbin compound. So here, is it possible that we can take a molecular approach to a disease like cancer? So not only now are we looking at plants, how they build robustness and health in the host, how we alter that microenvironment, but we can even, even take the food we eat and show that certain compounds, whether it be green tea compounds, olive oil compounds, omega-3s, apogeum, and parsley, and thyme, and actually a big one is delphinidin, which the richest source of delphinidin that, it, that we could actually eat is black currants, um, and actually alter the expression of her 2 nu cancer, which is a common type of breast cancer, but other cancers can also be her 2 nu driven. So here, the common drug, here's the beauty, the most well-known drug to treat her 2 nu cancer is called Herceptin. Here is Herceptin inhibiting breast cancer. Here's taking olive oil, a, a, a extra virgin olive oil, and combining it with Herceptin in the synergistic effect of olive oil and Herceptin. And olive oil is you know, one of the most important foods for us to be consuming. And here's on, and I can go on all on that, but I'm just giving you a little taste of different ways of seeing things. Different, again, the, the, that's the microscope way. And then we, you know, again, and here we have age-related stress and disease. So again, you have that, 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 that catabolic effect actually is involved. So stress and, and, and catabolism all, all, both induce inflammation, metabolic syndrome, mitochondrial dysfunction, um, which all lead to neurodegenerative diseases, um, and then increase in apoptosis, say in neurons and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And then you have um, in, inhibition of apoptosis in cancer cells. So again, the same herbs, the same herb compounds, the same dietary compounds can actually uh, inhibit apoptosis in healthy cells and induce apoptosis in cancer cells. When you look at cholesterol, so we all get a cholesterol panel done. There's lots of different ways. There's such misconception of whether cholesterol in and of itself is a risk factor. And so as you'll see, I'll just go through a couple of things because there's lots of different ways of looking at particle size of cholesterol, <laughs> at looking particle numbers of LDLs, looking, breaking them down and really trying to make sense of it um, because it, it's not just as blatant as high cholesterol is a risk factor. And so one of the things that we've learned, and you can see again all of the citations, is that you can look at the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. So what does that mean? Is that oxidation is kind of like rust. It's like you cut an apple, and what does it start to do? Brown, right? Well, that's oxidation. So if that's going on inside our body, that's not a good thing. So one of the, you know, on any level, but if lipid peroxidation is taking place through poor diet, aging, then that's a problem. So if you have a lot of LDL cholesterol and now it's in an, and you have inflammation and it's oxidizing, that's definitely a risk factor. But if LDL cholesterol is not in an oxidative state and there isn't inflammation present, most likely it's not harmful to us. So again, it's more complicated than overtly just cholesterol and then take this. There's more to it. <clears throat> Metabolic reprogramming using botanical medicine. So again, there's this, this, this major commonality of disease that we're seeing facing us. It's called metabolic syndrome, you know, or sarcopenia, which I mentioned, where we're, or our body mass, our healthy mass is going down and it's being replaced with not such healthy mass. And so how do we actually turn that around? So one of the ways is, again, through diet, through lifestyle changing, through exercise program or physical activity, but another is through certain plants. And so one of the most widely used plants and a featured plant in our formula called IG Sensitizer is Mamortica. You know, you can go most parts of the world, whether it be parts of Africa, the islands, uh, Asia, they all know this food, the bitter melon. And they all know it in their culture as a food for diabetes. It's the number one food for diabetes. 
that is an, a tremendous enhancer of AMPK, increases glucose transporters, um, activates mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, and improves fatty acid synthesis. All the things that we want are done through that plant. One of the most researched plants, it's been comparable to metformin, equally as good as metformin, but has a whole slew of other benefits and has no adverse effects. And it's a food. We use a concentrate of it, to, so you don't have to eat a whole bunch of it, but it's a food. And I recommend the food for people to eat. And another great compound, maybe even more research than resveratrol, I mean, not more research, but the research is even more exciting, is another stilbin compound called terastilbin, which comes from the, the Ayurvedic herb, uh, Terracarpus marsupium, and that's that plant, and a tremendous insulin sensitizer. So here you can see the role of nutraceutical CERT1 modulation in AMP and mTOR. So molecularly speaking on aging, one of the ways cellularly to improve our health and age more gracefully is to actually increase AMPK and then reduce or modulate what's called mTOR signaling. So when we talk in terms of molecular, these are important things. In so many plants, I have a whole Excel spreadsheet on all the plant compounds that activate AMPK and inhibit mTOR. Um, and this is you know, a, a very important part, evidence of synergistic effect. So it's not enough maybe to do one, but when you actually do upregulate AMPK and downregulate mTOR, all of a sudden, it, may, it has a tremendous uh, uh, ability to um, help us age more gracefully. Now, after the primary adaptogens and the nervines, so you, we got through that category, the next really important category I call is the companion adaptogens for healthy aging and chronic disease prevention. These are just a few. One is curcumin longa, which is the turmeric root. Another is Camellia sinensis, which is green tea. Another is Polygolum cuspinatum, which is the richest source of resveratrol. Another is the grape, the grape seed and the grape skin. And um, they offer a whole slew of phenolic compounds called anthrocyanithins or proanthrocyanithin oleogolomers. And so the pleiotrophic, meaning the broad spectrum effect, doing many things all at once, that's the beauty of herbs again, health-promoting, disease-preventing effects, <clears throat> protects against oxidative stress, tissue damage, inflammation, has heart benefits, including lower systolic blood pressure, heart rate, improves circulation, reduced edema, promotes healing, connective tissue, improves brain health, shows to inhibit the formation of fibrils by beta amyloid peptides. One, 12, uh, one study, uh, recent study, uh, demonstrated uh, that it had a very profound uh, uh, improving effect on cognitive function. And that's all from the same stuff. So it's nice to get that, again, broad spectrum effect when we don't yet have disease. And then as we see things happen, then we can get more specific with our medicine. But these are the ones that actually do so much. And again, the stilbin compounds you know, have great defense against age-related decline. <clears throat> and then here is that resveratrol again coming from wine and grapes. You know, in, in cancer, you have again a cell cycle arrest, you have induction of apoptosis, meaning that those bad cells. So, the same compounds in nature, whether they be phenolic compounds or the isothiocinates, in other words, eating lots of berries, lots of cruciferous vegetables, they have this incredible ability to protect our cells from disease, including cancer. Or if a cell is, is looking unhealthy to potentially repair it and reprogram it to be a healthy cell again, or actually induce apoptosis, meaning that cell is so far gone, it's so damaged, that it needs to, before it does harm to our body, it needs to die and get out of our system. So the same compounds can selectively do all of those things. Now, these stilbin compounds also inhibit platelet aggregation, which means they prevent our blood from becoming hypercoagulative and, and having um, you know, blood clots form, uh, heart disease, stroke, all of those things. Prevents LDL oxidation and have a, a, has a, controls inflammation, um, so has a profound uh, effect on helping us age better.
And then the next one is curcumin. So here, the, one of the most studied compounds, we use curcumin 3C, the most studied compound by a company called Sabinzas. Um, over 65 human clinical trials now have been done on that particular compound, all in areas of skin malignancy, psoriasis, organ transplant modulation, pancreatitis, biliary tract dysfunction, um, fallopian tube issues, um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, H. pylori, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, Alzheimer's disease, neurological disease, and then in the field of oncology as well. Here are all the diseases curcumin has shown to be beneficial in cardiovascular health, inflammatory diseases, cancer, lung disease, and others. Um, the list goes on and on. My monograph, which is my comp compilation of information on this herb, is now over um, 300 pages long with about 450 citations just on this one plant. And then here, the reason why quality, what, what Dr. Ross spoke to a little earlier about how in the marketplace there, there's such poor quality, that just recently here, curcuminoids contend safety-related markers of quality of turmeric dietary supplements sold in the retail marketplace, published in May 29, 2018. The bottom line of the study was 60% of off-the-shelf turmeric problems were synthetic. They weren't even real plant. 60% were synthetic. And then I have a bunch of slides on, on, on how turmeric breaks down into different metabolites. But now we're on to another great companion adaptogen, green tea. And these are the, uh, some of the co compounds in green tea. These are all of the uh, chronic disease uh, uh, where green tea has been shown to be beneficial. So again, you know, cardiovascular, obesity, metabolic disorders, stroke inhibition, inflammation, cancer, aging, neurodegenerative diseases. The green tea catagens, which include what's called EGCG, which is um, the epigallic catagen gallate compound. The extract we use is about 40% of that EGCG, about 70% total catagens, so you get all the catagens, and 95% phenolics. It's not decaffeinated because the caffeine adds to the benefit of the green tea, which is about 6% caffeine. Um, and the caffeine has uh, benefits that include, it's a phosphodiesterase 4 and 5 inhibitor. So it has benefits against leukemia, against asthma, against impotence, um, all kinds of things. And then green tea is also a big source, great source of another compound called theanine, which is shown also to extend the life of worms, increase survival of worms. So green tea, again, these herbs not only can help us manage, prevent chronic disease, but independent of that, they have this way of, of uh, adding and helping our life be longer. And quercetin, which is one of my favorite, you know, what we call, call phenolic or flavonoid compounds um, that I use extensively in my practice. It's actually in that botanical treasures formula and in CV Rescue, but I also use it additionally quite a bit um, because here's quercetin, besides all the benefits, resulted in lifespan increase of 10, 21 days, 19, and maximum life extension of 16%. So lifespan increasing effects was linked to the induction of this path MTH1 gene. So again, affecting um, uh, our, our epigenetics is, the, is a big component here. But then the thing that I love about quercetin is how many different areas it's been studied in as well. Increased exercise performance, diabetes, asthma, allergies, arthritis, anti-obesity, anti-cancer, anti-protective uh, uh, properties, mood disorders, aging, immunity, infection. So um, the richest source of food quercetin is the onion. So the yellow part of the onion in particular is the quercetin in there. Uh, astragalus, which is considered one of the great tonic herbs in traditional Chinese medicine, and for us it's the main ingredient in a formula we use called Imucare 1. Um, and everyone knows astragalus is such a good immune herb, and it is. It's an immune regulator, an immune modulator. 
Um, but what people don't know is that it also has profounding effects on helping us age gracefully. So you can see here it, uh, uh, it specifically has um, benefits, uh, beneficial effects on what's called the telomere, you know, helping telomere length, strengthen the telomere. Um, and it has probably the number one herb to give our bone marrow nourishment. And so again, as we're aging, our immune systems aren't as healthy. You get a, you know, when you're older, you get, you know, cold and it can put you in the hospital with pneumonia and then all of that. So partially with aging, we want to bolster up that, you know, kind of immune system as well, particularly going into the winter, into the colder weather. Astragalus is what I would call the number one herb in a non-specific way to aid immune system health. And you can see it has neuroprotective effects as well. Echinacea. There's uh, a woman at McGill University that's been studying, Sandra, her name is, that's been studying echinacea for years and years and years. And so she calls it the miracle herb against aging and cancer. I mentioned the eclectic physicians before, the great physicians in the country. Mm. 100, 150 years ago in America, the number one herb used medicinally was echinacea for a lot of different things. <coughs> and we can see here that it has an immune modulating effect. It's not this overtly just inflammatory immune uh, stimulant, but it actually regulates. It was used for uh, poison uh, d diseases of uh, poison blood, poison rust toxicity, um, long lasting illnesses. Um, so it wasn't just, it's not an herb for like a, a flu. Like people think I take echinacea for my flu. It is the number one herb to activate natural killer cells, however. You want to boost NK cells, echinacea is amazing. Um, and it, these are some other benefits that it has. It's even neuro, very neuroprotective. But here is the evidence in mice that mice with leukemia or mice with no disease significantly live longer when they were given echinacea. So she, again, evidence and that's her name, Sandra Miller, uh, up at McGill University. Enhancement of natural killer cells increased survival of aging mice fed echinacea root daily from youth. Increased the lifespan by 10 months just by taking echinacea. That's all they gave. No other difference. Give the mice echinacea, they live 10 months longer. And they have better natural killer cells. Like I said, the best thing. So what do we have here? Ginger another great companion adaptogen. And here's a new, brand new paper, 2018 paper actually, showing ginger to have profound thermogenic effects, meaning thermogenic means to increase our metabolism, to make our metabolism work better, to burn calories more efficiently. And then you'll see here echinacea having modulating effect on inflammation as well. So what could be better than an herb? And again, ginger is used in so many cuisines. It's taken every single day. And so to use uh, ginger to aid th uh, thermogenically and to buffer inflammation. Telomere, you know, the telomerase. The telomerase is a way, one of the ways that we measure aging in our body is through, you know, again, looking at the, the, uh, <clears throat> the effects of our you know, sort of our g chromosomal health and the best way right now, believe to be, to understand how we're aging, chromo uh, our chromosomes are aging and our DNA is aging, is through measuring the length of the telomere. So a study from the Lancet evaluated telomerase length on a group of individuals aged 60 and over and found those with the shortest telomeres had a 3.15 fold higher mortality rate from heart disease and an 8.54 fold higher mortality rate from infectious diseases. So this is something new. This is kind of cutting edge stuff looking at the telomere. Accelerated telomere shortened in response to life, life stress. Women with the highest level of perceived stress have telomeres shorter on average by the equivalent of at least one decade on additional aging compared to low stress women. So again, the more our, our lives become fast uh, uh, paced, overly stimulated day after day after day, you know, we just push and push and we don't realize the impact it's having because we can just keep pushing. But this is the cost again, everything has a cost. And so again, can we, can we maybe slow that down a little bit 
and then maybe give our body some ways to buffer that and, that, and expand, again, that dynamic range of healthy stability. And that's the idea here. Shorter telomerase linked to dimension mortality. And the findings of another found shortened uh, leukocyte telomerase in blood in mortality in people aged 60 years and older. So telomerase length may therefore be a marker of biological aging. Yes? It's the, it's the, uh, well, it's on here. Yeah, it says right here. So they are the sections of genetic material at the end of each chromosome whose primary function is to prevent chromosomal fraying when a cell replicates. And here, how do we, what things have been associated with helping telomere? So some of what I call all the usual suspects that we'd be taking anyway, for other reasons. Alpha lipoic acid, green tea extract, N-acetylcysteine, chlorella, L-carnosine, vitamin D3, rhodiola extract. These compounds increase telomerase activity in combination of the top ranking compounds were able to increase significantly from 51 to 290 percent relative to control. Vitamin D supplementation increased telomerase activity in overweight African Americans. Carotenoid levels and intake are associated with longer telomerase. So carotenoids we get from all of those foods that have that orange and red pigmentation to them, whether it be lycopene and tomatoes and watermelons or pink grapefruits or <clears throat> beta carotene and carrots and squash. All of those carotenoids in our food also aid in our telomerase health. Here, and we'll have a little bit more on that actually in a second, here we're going to look at moderate stress and how moderate stress and low exposure to toxins improves health and longevity. So the idea isn't to live in a toxic-free environment, to put a mask on ourselves, take a vaccine against every infection. We don't want to over be exposed, but we don't want to under be exposed to things. We want to have that nice, what's called, hormetic balance. Hormesis is, which means that a little bit of something is better than none of it or too much of it. And that's so, so true. And so the, it actually sets off. So if we have no exposure to oxidative stress, our ability to quench free radicals goes away. We have to be challenged to a degree, but we don't want to overly be challenged. So it's uh, really, really interesting. And so here, everything in balance, essential importance. So here is a great study on, on heart disease and estimated sodium excretion and risk of death of cardiovascular disease. What they found is that too little salt and too much salt were equally as bad for heart disease, that you have to have the right amount. So this whole idea, avoid salt, avoid salt, isn't the right way. But to decrease the level of maybe salt consumption is better. So we go from one extreme to the, to the next. Moderation with a lot of things is a better way to go. And here, so although there was a trend of higher adverse cardiovascular events with sodium excretion of over five grams a day, there was much more pronounced at levels under two grams today per day consumption of too little sodium is harmful as a consumption as too much. It may be even more harmful than too much. Here's on, on alcohol, then the same is true. One glass of wine promotes health and longevity. You know, over three glasses of wine decrease health and longevity. So you can see, and that's mostly true of wine and beers associated with decrease in cardiovascular events and mortality compared with abstinence. And here's a study on the protective effects of tea, red wine, chocolate, and diabetes. So. They all, in moderation, all of those things can be good for us. So we don't have to be obsessively compulsive if, if we're able to put everything in its place. And here is on exercise. Again, if you don't, you know, no exercise and too much exercise is equally as bad. There's emerging data that suggests a relationship between exercise intensity and adverse cardiovascular events. Moderate exercise is better than no exercise, but vigorous exercise may be harmful in some individuals. 
and exercise induces oxidative stress and, and dietary antioxidants can play a role. So polyphenols, all of those uh, purple and red pigment colors that we eat when we eat all the berries and purple potatoes and black rice, those are rich in polyphenols. And they, are, they have plant, secondary plant metabolites that help quench free radical damage and protect against chronic disease. And they are largely found in fruits, vegetables, teas, coffee, chocolate, legumes, potatoes, particularly purple and sweet, and whole grains. And so here's polyphenols in performance in athletes. So the pooled result of this systemic review and meta-analysis found that polyphenol supplementation for at least seven days increased performance by 1.9%. And quercetin was actually the best of all the flavonoids identified for increasing performance. So let's look at some blood tests now quickly, that the markers. So we talked about inflammation, um, insulin and C-peptide. We're going to just go a little bit more into those things and, and some of the nutrients. So this is from the Mayo Clinic for seedings. Cancer and cardiovascular disease have a complex relationship that may prove to be bidirectional and caused by similar underlying mechanisms, including inflammation. So, a tale of interplay between two families of disease. Inflammation, there's another brand new paper, May 2018. Inflammation, not cholesterol, is a cause of chronic disease. We're missing, we're missing the boat. And it may even be the benefits of statins, which there are some, might be more because they actually modulate inflammation than lower cholesterol, actually. <clears throat> In this review, we present all of the relative data that supports the view that inflammatory induced uh, by several factors, such as platelet activating factor, that leads to the onset of cardiovascular disease rather than serum cholesterol. And look at here, this is the relative risk of future cardiovascular events according to several different biomarkers. And then highly sensitive C-reactive protein, which is one of our best ways of measuring. So when you go into the office to see Dr. Ross, he's usually going to look at this. If you go somewhere else, you're not going to get this kind of blood test. And so we're able to see that that as a single test was the best, but even combining that with total cholesterol and HDL low density cholesterol ratio, when you combine the two, that was even more significant than just, the, just one. So no one bar biomarker is perfect. You can't rely on one. That's why you do a lot of different ones. <laughs> and then, let me see what this one is. So willow bark. Willow bark is probably, you know, you know willow bark dates back to Hippocrates, BC, of a great medicine for combating inflammation. You know, that was the main herb in historic medicine for combating inflammation was willow bark. And so uh, recently, this is very recent, in testing a bunch of plant extracts, it's been tested that willow bark extract increased the average chronological lifespan of yeast by 475% and the maximum chronological lifespan by 369%. So this little herb that's rich in this, you know, it's the basis of aspirin is willow bark. So salicylic acid was built uh, molecularly as a byproduct of salicin. So salicin is the natural compound in willow bark, which has no adverse effects, doesn't inc increase bleeding, and, it, it, and, and it, it converts into the salicylates in our body, you know, through, through gut fermentation. But salicylic acid, which is, which is what they made from salicin, besides having the health benefits of aspirin, has potential adverse effects. But salicin has been tested with no adverse effects, no increased bleeding time whatsoever. So willow bark is very, very safe to consume. It's the, we use quite a bit of that. It's the main ingredient in a pain formula called willow relief. We use it in other things as well. So these are all the mechanisms of action of taking uh, willow bark and how it mitigated aging. So you would, you, know, you would never have thought that willow bark. Now, one of the main nutrients, people I'm sure are familiar with, coenzyme Q10. And here's a couple of amazing recent studies. Here's a meta-analysis, meaning it's a whole bunch of studies that have been pooled together 
and then they, they, they extrapolate data from the meaning of all those studies. So they're the strongest, when you look at research, the strongest research is meta-analysis. And so this effect of COQ10 supplementation on inflammatory markers found that 17 uh, uh, studies were selected for the meta-analysis. Coenzyme Q10 significantly reduced the level of circulating C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Three you know, big, big inflammatory pathways tests that we look at. And we know COQ10 to be good for the heart, good for a lot of things, but we don't think of it in terms of mitigating inflammation. But again, sometimes making the engine tune up better reduces some of those byproducts like inflammation and oxidative stress. And here is another amazing brand new study that just came out, 2018 study. COQ10 or coenzyme Q10 and selenium for four years reduced cardiovascular mortality 12 years after supplementation with a validation of prevention of 10-year follow-up results of a prospective randomized double-blind placebo controlled trial in the elderly. So that meant that if you took the supplements for four years, you still had a benefit for many, many years after that, even if you discontinued taking them. And here's the effects of Q, uh, Cohen, brand new, this is an October 2018, just published study on, a, again, a meta-analysis study that found COQ10 significantly reduced the, my, the myopathy induced by statin drugs. And here's the difference, all the studies uh, taking, so you can see how much better people did if they added COQ10 at dealing with the adverse effects of statin drugs. Why isn't this in the headlines of the news? You only hear negative things about herbs, right? That's all they want to do. There's lots and lots of bias out there. Tremendous bias, because this is you know, really, really great information. Um, so now we'll look into the hemoglobin AC. I talked about the AMPK, the insulin sensitizing. This is a way that we, we the lens that we use, because these are lenses to look at that. So high levels of A1C are associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. It's not just a marker for diabetes. And so overall, in conclusion, higher A1C levels is associated with increased mortality from all-cause, including cardiovascular cause, and uh, without known diabetes. So it's not just a marker for diabetes. So here's the effects of another nutrient we use, alpha-lipoic acid. So our formula CV Rescue is, is stilbin compounds, resveratrol, terastilbin, alpha-lipoic acid, actually the R-lipoic acid, the, uh, the, and um, ambiquinol, the reduced form of COQ10. So again, these are brand new. The effects of alpha-lipoic acid on inflammatory markers among patients with metabolic syndrome and related disorders, the systemic review. Here again, look at all the benefits taking alpha-lipoic acid is across the board you know, meta-analysis demonstrates promising impact of alpha-lipoic acid on decreasing inflammatory biomarkers, again, with metabolic syndrome, the, probably the leading cause of chronic disease in our country. Another couple of plants that I love, which is in our formula, Willow Relief, and also the basis of our formula called Colas, is Google, which is one of the gifts that was brought to the baby Jesus, frankincense and myrrh and gold. And here is, you know, a wise man cure frankincense and myrrh. You cannot believe the explosion of data on these two plants on the health benefits they provide for us. Google, you know, here is Google. Here is the myrrh gum. That's what Google is, myrrh gum. Look at all the in, clinical trials that it's been done with, the in vivo studies that have been shown uh, for beneficial, from liver protection, thyroid health. Google is one of the only substances in the world that show to improve T4 to T3 conversion in the thyroid. Lower serum lipids. <clears throat> Wonderful, incredible plants these two plants are. Uh, this is just, a, I know that, that uh, Dr. Ross always checks people's homocysteine studies. Just to give you an idea, a review of 26 studies found that for each uh, t each uh, discipline that the uh, um, homocysteine goes up, the risk of cardiovascular disease increases 20 to 50 percent as well. An optimal range, 5 to 11. 
And that's, we mostly address that through supplementation. It's harder, eating more of a plant-based diet certainly helps that quite a bit as well. Um, but more through uh, what's called uh, methyl donors, various methyl donors. Um, N-acetylcysteine, another big supplement we use. So these are all the different ways. It's the number one way to boost the intercellular production of glutathione, which is really important to how our cells um, uh, mitigate free radical damage. And it's been shown to be beneficial in a whole wide range of diseases. It's the only supplement that every emergency room and hospital has. And they give it because it's the antidote for Tylenol overdose which, which is, damages the liver. So the only thing known to protect the liver in wake of Tylenol overdose is N-acetylcysteine. All of these different conditions has been shown. It's very, very inexpensive nutrient. And then here is a study, a new study showing that, that N-acetylcysteine increases resistance to environmental stressors and also increases lifespan as well. I did that. O blood group. O is more protective against diseases like cancer and heart disease than other blood, blood groups. So if you happen to be born with an O blood group, it seems to be a good thing. <laughs> Top nutrient deficiencies in the U.S. So I talked about vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, iron, selenium, and iodine. These are some of the you know, most <coughs> widely deficient nutrients that we have you know, walking around with. So here, vitamin D supplementation, March 2018, University of Bergen, vitamin D reduces early mortality by 30%, right there. All-cause mortality, here's the difference in all-cause mortality from pooled analysis as well, with low vitamin D levels versus normal uh, vitamin D levels. The risk of all-cause mortality is inversely related to serum 25 OH vitamin D levels. And I have, uh, I could probably do a two or three hour presentation on all the data just on vitamin D. Here's vitamin D and ICU mortality rates. Those that had sufficient vitamin D fared better than those that had insufficient. Vitamin D deficiency correlates with increased cardiovascular incidence. Right there. And this is also uh, just amazing how many different different studies there are on, on, on vitamin D. Vitamin D intake associated with significant reduction in breast cancer mortality. So if you have breast cancer, this is 30 prospective studies, and you took vitamin D, it helped you. There's a study with HER2 new breast cancer that had increased the effectiveness of Herceptin by the medium sur uh, progression-free survival from around seven months to 13 months. It almost doubled the effectiveness of that drug just by adding vitamin D to it. We use a very special D. It's, again, a naturized D. It has two forms of K in it, and it has a vitamin A from, palm, from red palm oil to give you all those beautiful carotenoids. Because if you don't, D has to be taken with K. But otherwise, you can um, cause some hypercalcinemia. So you have to be a little bit careful with regular D. So here is, again, highest to lowest categories of blood vitamin D level. Uh, in, um, <clears throat> this is a study, a meta-analysis of breast cancer mortality in relationship to vitamin D. Look at how much better, just normalizing vitamin D. Now, why isn't every oncologist doing this? Results, this is on zinc now, because a lot of people are familiar with vitamin D, right? How important it is. But zinc might be even more important than vitamin D when you really look at the research. As we get older, almost everybody becomes zinc deficient. <laughs> And zinc levels are imperative to our immune system's health. So the global prevalence of inadequate zinc intake from national food balance sheets. This is a Harvard community study. It's very prevalent. Um, zinc supplementation on healthy aging. Zinc is the number one nutrient for your immune system. You cannot have a healthy immune system without adequate zinc. I don't care what herbs you take. Again, here's again. The herbs do certain things, the nutrients do certain things. They, can't, they don't replace each other. Just like a good diet isn't the same as taking herbs. You know, it's all the beauty is in the synergy of the medicine. Um, it also increases cognitive performance and mood, and also is essential for prevention of macular degeneration. And here's zinc's impact on the immune system. 
T cell production, natural killer cell production, all dependent on zinc. And here's the association between copper and zinc. So I also know that Dr. Ross is always checking people's zinc levels and copper levels. So here's why in, diet in a cardiovascular disease, association between high copper and low zinc and mortality from cardiovascular disease. And it's such an easy thing. You take some zinc and your zinc level comes up, you know? And magnesium is the third most important. Very, very deficient. 75% of the U.S. population is getting suboptimal levels of magnesium in their diet. Here's all the things that magnesium deficiency causes. Early symptoms, moderate deficiency, severe deficiency. Cardiovascular change, rapid heart rate. And here's magnesium and inflammation. So magnesium, there are three nutrients to regulate the inflammatory cascade in your body. Three, magnesium, zinc, and B6. If you're deficient, and what did I say? Zinc and magnesium we're deficient in. So we're going to be more inflammatory because we're deficient in magnesium and zinc because the whole what's called eicosanoid balance is dependent on magnesium and zinc. And here's magnesium and brain health. Oral, oral administration of magnesium enhances learning and memory. Also beneficial effects of magnesium on anxiety as well. And magnesium Im uh, improves physical performance in older women. Iron deficiency, another big one, as people getting older, they tend to start getting anemic and that your body works so hard if you're iron anemic. So just another one to look at, anemia in the aging population. Even in critical care, people in advanced, like in nursing homes, it's really, they're almost all uh, anemic. Um, on the life extending uh, effects of EPA and DHA, which is basically fish oil, this is, again, five combined uh, trials were considered. Uh, this level increased, reduced all-cause mortality by 21% and cardiac death by 35% and sudden death by 45%. And here is also on cardiovascular benefits. So let me move on to some food. This is also a new study showing omega-3 fatty acids found in seafood linked to healthy aging. So I promote what's called a pescatarian diet, mostly a plant-based diet with some fish and some really healthy dairy food as well. That's the diet that I eat. This is on lithium. Do you know that lithium used to be part of 7-Up Soda? Well, the original 7-Up had lithium in it. But low, low amounts of a lithium are actually shown to, to uh, help mood and also reduce the aging process. The town I live in, um, Ashland, has the highest, lit, second highest lithium content water uh, in the world, actually. And here's on low dose lithium uptake promotes longevity in humans. And this is combining. So when we start to eat better, we get a little physical activity, we abo avoid overconsumption or of abusive things we even do better. So again, this is a, the beauty of how things uh, synergize and work together. Healthy lifespan increases life expectancy by up to seven years. So combining these things together can make that big of a difference in our health. So lastly, this is the last part of the talk, and I have about 10 minutes and then we're gonna be done. So if you can hang in there. So this is, uh, this is about food now. So food isn't just, you know, food is about what you eat, but also why you eat, when you eat, how do you eat, where do you eat, and who do you eat with. All of these things matter, you know. And that's Sardinia, Italy, which is one of the longest, one of the blue zones, one of the longest living areas. Uh, uh, people, people live the longest in Sardinia. It's known as a, a long longevity uh, haven, particularly for men. So... Aristotle says happiness is a final goal is, uh, that encompasses the totality of one's life and it's the ultimate purpose of human existence. So I have bread because my favorite food is really good whole grain bread. <laughs> so association of animal and plant protein intake with all-cause mortality. 
So it's, it's very, very uh, conclusive that a plant-based diet somewhere between um, 80 and 85 percent appears to be the best diet for most, most human beings. It, it's not 100 percent, so, so the vegan diet where there's no animal food is not as good as the diet that's 85 percent vegan and 15 percent non-vegan. Healthy Medi Mediterranean diet habits linked to longer telomeres. So we go back to the telomeres and see how you eat can change that and affect that. Food groups and the risk of all-cause mortality, again, a systemic review of prospective studies found the risk of mortality decreased by 25% by increasing the intake of whole grains. So this whole idea that grains are bad for you is a complete falsehood. Grains might be the number one food when we really analyze the data to promoting longevity over anything else. But it has to be whole grains, not refined grains. Refined grains are poisonous. Whole grains are health promoting. So you can see here, you know, compared to vegetables, everything else that had the, the, the best score was the whole grain score. Mediterranean diet might even blunt air pollution ill effects as well here. And a good diet is a diverse diet. So that's on that. Research have discovered how to slow aging. So right here. Fiskin is a compound found in all these foods now associated with positive effects on health and lifespan. <coughs> Organic food consumption associated with reduced cancer risk. So to the best of our ability, we eat wild food and organic food to the best of our ability. Now let's look at what are the typical breakfasts around the world of some of the healthiest countries in the world. So here's one typical breakfast in Iceland. So you have your nice plate of muesli, your little bit of toast, a little bit of honey, your cup of coffee, and that's you know their bowl of porridge. And I have them from many, many others. Let me go here. This is in a Middle East country. That's shashuka. It's like a tomato sauce with some poached eggs in it with peppers. That's one there. And here is a typical breakfast in Switzerland. So also very healthy, a little croissant, but a lot of uh, uh, fruits there with that, a fresh squeezed orange juice, and a little bit of cereal there as well. And then to the healthiest country, what do they have for breakfast? <laughs> so this is the Italians. They were ranked number one, healthiest country in the world in 2017. Usually a little bit of bread and rolls with some jam and a cappuccino, so there, so there you go. So coffee may bring longer life. That's what we're learning. So two large studies boost potential benefits of coffee, and one looked at consumption in all races. So the finding based on, on 700,000 middle-aged and older adults adding to the growing benefits linking moderate coffee drinking to good and long and healthy life. Health benefits associated with whole grains, so you can see here, I mean, tremendous. I mean, when you start to see the reduction in chronic disease by bringing in whole grains, it's astonishing. And um, here's whole grain intake and mortality from all cause, uh, cardiovascular and cancer systemic review as well. Each additional uh, serving, three servings of whole grains, was associated with a 25% lower risk of mortality from heart disease. And here's the difference again with, with whole grain intake. And one of the benefits, and we look at immunotherapy now, a big part of treating cancer, so the gut microbiome, the health of the gut, which is very important to the immune system, it, it gets enriched with probiotic, good, good microflora by eating whole grains. Yes, we have to eat our probiotic foods, our sauerkraut, our fermented foods, but they need to be activated by what's called the short-chain fatty acids, which means that when you have fermented food um, and whole grains together, it, it does something that neither one does without it. And what is the best way to get that? Bread. Bread is a fermented food. You take an ancient old organism like Saccharomyces or a culture like a sourdough culture, you mix it with whole grains, you bring the particle size down, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a fermented food. With, with lots of bio uh, uh, absorption of nutrients because you know bread because of the particle size the way it is made with whole grains 
is, you know, this incredible food. And it's so, to me, it's like mind blowing that every culture in the world figured out how to make a bread, right? Mm -hmm. Like every culture. So, um, and so here's, again, why bread is so important. It's God rained down bread, manna from heaven to sustain the nation. Uh, you know, Exodus 16.4, you know, th there would be no Jews if it wasn't for bread, right? What did God leave? <laughs> manna, he says they crossed the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sea, the Red Sea, and they're there, and says, well, what are you going to eat? He doesn't say, I give you broccoli, I don't give you your berries, I give you bread, you know, because there's something about it Nutritionally speaking, socially, we sit together and we break bread, you know, that binds us together. Culturally, economically, you, can, you cannot feed the world if you don't include whole grains. They're the humblest, easiest, most cost-efficient way, lowest environmental impact on the world, and spiritually, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So, you know, there's something about it that we are missing. And again, I consider a whole, a whole food Mediterranean diet to be you know, with a little Asian flair occasionally to be the healthiest way to go. So that's the kind of the way that I believe in eating. Um, so let's go here. That's more on that. Moderate carbohydrate. This is a brand new study published August 16, 2018 that looked at all these different diets and found that moderate carbohydrate intake was the best. You know, you could see here, following 15,000 people in the, in the U.S. for over 25 years, that either this, you know, a high fat, no carbohydrate diet or an overly high carbohydrate diet were not the way to go. You really want to get, you know, diversity and balance and quality is the way. Olives, one of the most important food. Olive oil rich diets are related to significant reduction in all cause mortality. And here's olive polyphenols, all the different things it does metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. Oleoropin is one of the most amazing compounds in olives and olive oil. Hydroxytyrosol is in olives as well. You have a compound called squalene in olives. You have oleic acid in olives. They're so amazing for you. And so I'm a big proponent of that. Here is that oleoropin showing to be inhibitory to heart disease, diabetes, cancer, skin disorders, neurological. And again, you look at the culture, you, you look at food and say, what did people do in so many cultures for hundreds and thousands of years, and then what is science telling us? And when science and tradition say the same thing, you're good to go, in my opinion. When they conflict each other, then maybe not. So I'll show you, pomegranates coming into season now, amazing food. That's me in Israel when I lectured there for a week, you know, a meal in Israel, that's a salad in Israel. These are these are little yams, cooked yams, actually thrown into the salad. I just thought that was such a beautiful salad with the seeds in there. In there, Hot peppers shown to increase long life. So all those people that like those hot peppers, those are good for you too. And now the big one, I said this is what you can't trust. This is eggs consumption. This is also a 2018 study that said association of egg consumption with cardiovascular disease in a cohort study of Chinese people and, and found no correlation between egg consumption and heart disease. And if we go back 30, 40 years, cholesterol was blamed on heart disease and what was everybody told in response? Don't eat eggs. Without any evidence whatsoever. No evidence. It was just making a theory and that's all it was based in. And now we see the opposite. Chocolate, cocoa improves gut microbiome and health. So not only chocolate is a good food for your microbiome, dark chocolate buffers stress in people as well. And then finally, the last slide, Pope Francis, one of my big idols, loving kindness is so important. And then Albert Einstein, one knows from deep reflection that we exist for others. So that's uh, Albert Einstein also says that intuition is the gift. Intuition is the gift. The intellect is the servant. We now live in a world that we honor the servant and have forgotten the gift. So, so anyway, that's it, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for staying a little longer. I'm sorry about that. <laughs>